All right. Hello, and welcome to our 4 p.m. press conference, The Ocean's Hidden Heat. Our speakers today are Tim Boyer at the National Centers for Environmental Information at NOAA, Robert Tyler at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, Catherine Walker from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and Stephanie Scholar Ooze from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Hi, I'm Tim Boyer from NOAA's National Center for Environmental Information. And we're, we're going to talk today uh, about a, a novel new possibility for measuring ocean heat content from satellite. And so I'm going to set that up. Why, why is ocean heat content important? Um, how do we measure it now? And uh, what are the problems with the way we measure it now? And uh, I'll give away a little bit of the answer. We're talking ocean's hidden heat. And it's hidden because 90% of the excess, more than 90% of the excess heat that enters the Earth's system is sequestered in the ocean, is taken away from the surface uh, and into deeper depths in the ocean. So here, this is a, this is a figure from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, uh, Assessment Report uh, 5 from 2003. And this is, this is a diagram of the Earth's, uh, the Earth's heat balance. And on the left there, the units here are watts per meter squared. On the left is incoming solar radiation. Uh, and these are big numbers, 340 watts per meter squared coming in. And on the right, that's the long wave radiation that's going out. So uh, again, big numbers, and there's a lot going on in the Earth's system here. And what, what we're concerned about, what, what's really important for us here on, on, on Earth, or when we talk about climate change, is this very small amount, 0 0.6 watts per meter squared. That's the amount that, the imbalance, the amount that's staying in the Earth's system that's coming in but not going out. So, so where is that heat going? How is it distributed in the Earth's system? And, and here's what I said before. More than 90% of that imbalance in the Earth's heat budget is going into the ocean. This is, again, this is a figure from the, um, the IPCC report, AR5. And now the, the units we're using now are, are joules. Uh, joules are, these are pure energy units, and these are actually zeta joules, which are 10 to the 21st joules. So, so very big numbers. And we're just looking at the change here because there's so much heat in the ocean. If, if you try to look at just the difference of the total ocean heat content, uh, the, the difference, the change would be way down in the decimal points. So we're just looking at the anomaly, the change over time. And, and what you can see here in, in the orange and in the, the purple, way down there at, near the bottom of the, of the graph, uh, that's... That's the amount of heat that's being stored in the atmosphere and the land, so what we're actually feeling. But that amount, the, the dark blue and the light blue, that's the amount that's going into the ocean. So it's a huge amount of heat that's going into the ocean, and that dark blue is that deeper part, deeper than 700 meters, between 700 and 2,000 meters. And so that heat is being taken away from the surface and sequestered at, at deeper depths. Of course, this, this doesn't mean, yes, it's a hidden heat. It's hidden from our, our surface system, but we still feel it in, in sea level change because, of course, as the ocean warms up, it expands. So, so this is from Levitas et al., 2012, and this is, this is um, ocean heat content again from 1955 to the present. And the, the red curve is, is that change in, in zeta joules over that time period, the change from, from a baseline mean over the entire period from 1955 to 2006. So it's been steadily rising. And the, the smaller curve, the, the black curve, that's that deeper curve again. That's uh, between 700 and 2,000 meters. And again, that's been, been steadily rising. But why do we only go back to 1955? That's because these are from in situ data. These are ocean profiles, um, at least until recently, basically taken from ships. So you have to drop an instrument over to the depth in the ocean and, and uh, get, get the temperature that way. So not an easy way to, to get your information. And uh, these calculations, these, this is uh, the Levitas plus seven other groups around the world who are calculating ocean salinity, uh, excuse me, ocean heat content uh, historically. And this is just from 1970 to, to present, uh, actually just to 2010. This is from a recent paper. And it shows that all of these different calculations that the different groups are doing, they all show the same thing, that the ocean heat content has been steadily increasing since 1970. But as you can see, the year-to-year -year variations, or the variations within year between the methods, can be quite large. And the reason for this is mainly, and there's other reasons, but the main reason is the sparsity of data, the sparsity of the information that we have. So, as, as I was saying, due to incomplete ocean coverage, so what you see at the bottom there, that's the, actually the ocean heat 
content change uh, for year 2015. And what you see, the red is where the heat is higher, There's, it's warmer, the ocean is warmer than the long-term mean. The blue is where it's cooler than the long-term mean. So even now in 2015, although the global uh, integral is, is increasing steadily, it, it's not every part of the ocean is, is warming steadily. There's a lot of dynamics going on in the ocean. So we really need to measure the entire ocean, all parts, to get a good handle on what's going on. And what you see the top left there, that's the coverage we had in 1989, from, mainly from ships, some from merchant ships or research ships. So we really don't have great coverage, especially in the southern hemisphere. On the right there, we have our uh, year 2015 coverage, and that's the Argo floats, these automated floats that, that rise to the surface, um, go from the surface to 2,000 meters every 10 days and report their information to satellites. And there are about 4,000 of those floats out there. It's a huge effort. But even there, you can see that there are gaps, the Indonesian through-flow area, the near coastal areas, and the Arctic and Antarctic. We, we still don't have sufficient in situ information there. And it's, of course, deeper than 2,000 meters. We don't have that information either, except for Margo. Excuse me, uh, a, a few deep Argo floats which are out now. So now I'll turn it over to, to Rob Tyler. Okay, uh, magnetic remote sensing of ocean heat content. If you've not heard of that method, it's because it doesn't yet exist. It's something that we're testing, something that we're uh, experimenting with. First of all, to begin describing what this is, let's start by describing what the physical phenomena is underneath this that we're trying to exploit. Well, as most of us know, the Earth has a magnetic field. Sometimes that's, this is depicted with magnetic uh, field lines. Uh, those aren't static, but they're varying in time. There's fluctuations on these magnetic uh, field lines that we can measure with ground observatories as well as uh, satellites. Uh, it's the job, of the job of the geomagneticians to try to interpret these fluctuations and determine what their sources are and uh, what that might be indicating about the Earth's system. One component of these fluctuations is due to the ocean flow. The tides, say, are rocking back and forth, and they, uh, they tend to drag the magnetic field lines with them. The reason for that is that the ocean has salts in it, and it's a pretty good conductor. Uh, the higher the conductivity of the ocean, the better the dragging, and the higher the temperature of the water, the better the conductivity. So in a sense, by, by, uh, watch, by, by monitoring these fluctuations in the magnetic field lines, we might be able to use that as a thermometer for what, uh, what temperature changes are happening in the ocean. Uh, we're at the testing stage, so we start with simple examples, and one of the simple examples of ocean flow, flow is the tides. Uh, and one component of the tides is the uh, semi-diurnal or twice daily M2 tide up here. Here is a movie of the, of the M2 tide surface displacement as it propagates around with its 12.4 hour periodicity. Down here are the associated magnetic fluctuations as we calculate using a numerical model. So this is essentially a prediction. Given this, what magnetic field fluctuations do we expect? Well, we expect this. This is what we observe by analyzing data. Now, if you look at these two, they look very similar. This is a validation. Uh, these are created independently, so this is a validation of two things. Number one, that we can theoretically generate the magnetic fluctuations that we expect, and number two, that we can also observe them. By monitoring these ocean tidal magnetic fluctuations, may we infer any ocean parameters? And the answer is yes. These magnetic fluctuations depend on the electrical conductance of the ocean. We can attempt to numerically invert the magnetic observations to gain ocean conductance. Well, if we can infer ocean conductance from remote magnetic observations, so what? Why would that be important? Well, as it turns out, um, analyzing uh, data from, uh, that's been observed within the ocean, there is a strong linear relationship between, um, essentially between conductance and, the, and, and heat content. This uh, graph over here is in terms of depth averages because we want to take the, the, the depth out of the, the picture here. But there's a strong linear relationship, which means that if we, have, uh, if we have conductance, we can convert that into heat content. The exceptions that don't obey this line are these, uh, these blue dots here, which are describing inland seas and regions near, uh, you know, like in the Arctic, for example, where you have high river runoff. So there's big salinity variations. But most of this, there's a very strong linear relationship allowing us to convert conductance into heat content. So where are we in developing the proximate goal of inferring conductance from remote magnetic observations? 
Well, first of all, we've demonstrated an important proof and concept. Our inversion method recovers highly accurate maps of conductance from the theoretically generated tidal magnetic fields. So if you think of those as, as sort of the noise-free case, we've shown that, that given the magnetic fields, we can recover the conductance. And then that last slide showed you that we can turn that into heat content. Now, when we try to do that with the observations, that's currently limited by the accu by accuracy, or uh, the accuracy is limited by either the noise in the observations and or imperfect modeling. But we're at an early effort to improve the methodology, and there's also three uh, European Space Agency swarm satellites covering the Earth's magnetic field. So there's a survey going on right now that has never happened before. There's usually never even been one magnetic survey satellite up in the air, and now there's three. Uh, and this will be going on for some years, maybe even to the end of 2030. So there's a lot of magnetic data that will be becoming available and giving us a, uh, a very exciting new opportunity. Thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Catherine now. Um, okay. Hello. Um, so I'll be talking about the Southern Ocean and particularly Antarctica. Um, and so what sort of effects we would expect um, from a warming ocean um, down in the uh, southern pole. Uh, um, so the, the point of this slide here is to sort of point out the, as both Tim and Rob have pointed out already, the sort of lack of information that we have about the ocean uh, around Antarctica. We, we have very little to go on. We have Argo floats, but obviously those are sort of sparse in the southern hemisphere, um, particularly around Antarctica where about half the year uh, the ocean is covered with sea ice. Um, uh, and then over on the right, those are um, our best bet, basically, for uh, coverage around the Southern Ocean, which are marine mammals that have been tagged with uh, temperature and salinity devices on their heads. And kindly, they swim around and measure uh, temperature and salinity uh, for us. But obviously, we can't really depend on their directional abilities. They go wherever they want, and we get data wherever they go. Um, and then this bottom grid shows, uh, this is an example of one of the, um, I have a pointer, I don't have to. Uh, v. Vanna White. Um, the, this bottom grid is uh, a, sort of an example of a, a long-term ecological research uh, station, which um, is off the Antarctic Peninsula, so right over here, um, that's maintained by the NSF. Um, but just to point out that these are sort of regional measurements that can be taken, random measurements, and not so many measurements. So we don't really have much to go on in the Southern Ocean right now. Um, this is a, a sort of composite of seafloor temperatures um, from a, a paper in Nature in 2012 by Pritchard et al. Um, what, you, what you can observe here is that um, the western side of Antarctica, right here along the peninsula and West Antarctica, um, you have seafloor temperatures that are fairly warm. Um, and then as you get around East Antarctica, it's cooler, particularly on the continental shelf, which is the shallow part of the ocean right around the Antarctic margin. Um, those parts are fairly cool around East Antarctica and warm on West Antarctica. <clears throat> and the particular implications of warm water around Antarctica is melting ice, obviously. <clears throat> um, so as Tim mentioned before, one of the components of sea level rise is a warming uh, thermal expansion. So a warming ocean means you have a sort of larger ocean. Um, and then the second component or major component is melting ice from the polar um, ice caps. Uh, so this one is the, the biggest one, Antarctica. Um, and these, these pink areas are ice shelves. So they're floating, uh, floating masses of ice that are sort of holding back the rest of the ice on the Antarctic continent. And this is a side view of, a, of an ice shelf. Um, as it's coming down off the continent, it's floating. So it's already made its contribution to sea level, so we don't really have to worry about that. But as water gets underneath, um, as long as that water stays sort of uh, as it is right now, it's sort of at equilibrium in most areas of Antarctica, and you don't really get that much melting um, that will offset or that won't offset the accumulation that you already have. But <clears throat> as you have this warming offshore, this is majorly uh, a body of water called the circumpolar deep water. It's sourced from the oceans of the world. It kind of sinks down uh, to the bottom of the ocean in the, of the uh, entire globe and gets around Antarctica and starts sort of going around like this. I'll show an animation in a minute. Um, but this is starting to get higher and higher in the water column. So it can flood over the continental shelf and get under here to the grounding line and melt these ice shelves. So you decrease any sort of blockage that it's creating around Antarctica and getting inshore. 
so you can start draining the Antarctic ice sheet faster. <clears throat> uh, on the right, uh, these are the, the nice seals that we have uh, off the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, these are a compilation of data from 2005 to 2011 at 300 meters depth. So this is right over the continental shelf. So they're measuring right about here, right over here. Um, and then what you're looking at is that it's warm towards the south end of the peninsula and colder up at the northern end. Um, and if you had a map of ice shelf retreat, which I'm not showing, um, you would see that these glaciers up here are mainly advancing and these ones are retreating. So they're melting faster than these ones. So mainly a function of ocean temperature. Um, this area here is called Marguerite Bay, which is what I'm showing on this slide. Um, this is a former ice shelf that used to be there. It's called Wordy Ice Shelf. Um, and these are velocities on the Antarctic Peninsula, which was shown in an earlier event today um, by colleagues at JPL. Um, so this is the bathymetry that's sort of on the continental shelf of, it, of the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, very deep trough that goes in here and, and kind of sucks in the circumpolar deep water and brings it towards the coastal ice. Um, this yellow box is where we have seal measurements that we've sort of averaged uh, yearly. So you can see how it's progressed from 93, 1993 is red, to present, or 2014 sort of present, uh, in blue. So you can see that it's basically, uh, for the last 20 or so years, just increased in temperature uh, fairly consistently. <clears throat> um, so this is just a little animation. Um, all these movies are showing the same thing, just zoomed views. Um, this is called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which carries the warming uh, circumpolar deep water. And as you can see, it's sort of flooding in, it's hard to see on this, but it's sort of flooding in towards the continent. Um, this uh, continental outline up here, everything that's blue there is below sea level. Uh, usually has, currently it has ice on top of it, so you can't see that. But uh, if you think about warm deep water getting in under the ice shelves, all of these things are under or below sea level. So as long as the water can get up onto the continental shelf, it can get underneath the ice. Um, these are velocities by a colleague at uh, JPL that show you where all those floating ice is, is speeding up. So you're sort of getting melting effects there. And then this last plot shows elevation change. So as you can see, on West Antarctica, you have a lot of thinning. So red means thinning. Blue, which there isn't so much of, means thickening. Um, so we can already see the effects of warming ocean here on West Antarctica. Not so much yet on east, but we are starting to see little pockets of change due to warming inflow of circumpolar deep water on the east. And now I'll turn it over to Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Scholar Ooze. And before I get into the specifics of my research, I'm going to describe a little bit about the big picture. Um, and it's estimated that 99% of living surface on Earth is in the ocean. And a lot of that biomass, most of that biomass, is phytoplankton. Phytoplankton come in very diverse shapes and sizes, as you can see from some of the examples here, such as diatoms, larger diatoms, smaller synecococcus, and um, coccolithophores with calcium um, plates. Um, we know that since 1997, NASA has been monitoring phytoplankton in the ocean through the pigment chlorophyll. And from that, it's really revolutionized our understanding of phytoplankton distributions and how they change at seasonal to interannual timescales um, through physical processes. We know that warming and um, increased acidification in the ocean is going to cause winners and losers among the phytoplankton communities um, from modeling studies, but we don't yet know exactly how. So the specifics of my study, um, which is in review with Journal of Climate, and it was started at the University of Maryland through NOAA funding with co-authors Tony Busalaki, who's now at UCAR, um, Tim, um, Tom Smith and Chris Brown of NOAA, and Mike Evans and Eric Hackert of University of Maryland. So we took the um, tropical Pacific that has extremely strong physical forcing, and we, we applied a method called statistical reconstruction to derive chlorophyll back. The microphone died. Um, hello? Can you hear me if I just talk loudly? OK. So we took um, physical data sets. 
Is that one working? Okay. Okay. Nope. I don't think it's working. Hello? Testing? Testing? Should I just talk loudly and continue? Yes? yes? Okay. So, um, so we took um, physical data sets and used them as proxies in the tropical Pacific that experiences a big signal from um, um, from El Nino, and you've, you've all probably heard about the um, periodic oscillation called El Nino, where the, um, the winds that normally bro blow from east to west and pile up warm water in the West Pacific, they periodically, the winds die, and that warm water um, propagates across to the East Pacific. And NOAA declares an El Nino when temperatures are greater than half a degree Celsius for more than five months. And you can see over the past 50 years, there have been about a dozen El Nino events. Last winter, we had a very strong one. And then the opposite phase is La Nina, where the temperatures are cooler than normal. And this has implications for the biology. So we took the, these physical differences that relate to the vertical flux of nutrients, um, and we used sea surface temperature and sea surface height, two proxies, which are correlated, but they also represent different processes in the ocean. And we use that to derive chlorophyll. So I'm going to show you um, this region in the here from New Guinea over to the Galapagos. So as I'm going to show you an average of chlorophyll from west to east over the 51-year reconstruction. Whoops. OK, and it's filling in. So these w blue waters represent less productive waters, and the green waters are more productive. Um, and you can see that there's annual and interannual variation. And here I've plotted the contour of the east edge of the warm pool, so that delineates the less productive from the more productive waters. And this is important because the commercially viable fisheries, such as skipjack tuna, are known to follow along that demarcation between unproductive and productive waters. Um, and you can see that the biggest change is due to El Nino and La Nina. And so from, for example, the difference between a La Nina year and an El Nino year is that's as much as the distance between San Francisco and Tokyo. So it's, it's very important um, to understand how these patterns are, are occurring. And in addition to the interannual patterns, we see decadal patterns and shifts. Um, and here's spatially what we have mapped now for the first time the strong El Nino of 1972-73, um, 82-83, 97-98, and then La Nina patterns. And so you, again, you can see that that least, less productive water um, prevails during an El Nino and more productive during La Nina. During the La Nina of 99-2000, of they estimated there was a 40% increase in fisheries catch that year. So it's not only impacting tuna, it's also impacting uh, pelagic fish such as sardines and anchovies off the coast of South America and along the equator. And then we, we are also highlighting in this data set the differences between El Ninos that propagate all the way to the east, known as East Pacific El Ninos, um, versus Central Pacific El Ninos that don't make it very far past the date line. So East Pacific El Ninos are known to impact the nutrient layer all the way across the basin, whereas Central Pacific El Ninos stop, and they don't have a basin-wide impact. They're a more local impact. Um, so I'm going to show you the reconstruction over 51 years. I'll, I'll just animate through this. Is it? Command tab. OK, I'm going to play this animation. Um, so you'll notice that there are features that propagate along during an El Nino. It's a, a blue feature or a unproductive feature that propagates, and then during a La Nina, there's, there's green that propagates these oceanographic features. And in addition to the El Ninos and the La Ninas, we see changes that are associated with decadal changes in the equatorial undercurrent that brings nutrients from great depth off of New Guinea over toward the East Pacific.
And that's the end of my presentation. If there are any questions, you can ask them as the animation continues. OK, um, thank you. So we'll take questions from reporters in the room. Please state your name and affiliation. Are there any questions from folks in the room? Okay. Boston Hunt, uh, The Economist. A uh, question for Dr. Boyer, uh, maybe for Dr. Tyler as well. Um, what Dr. Tyler told us is that he has, um, is developing a better method to, um, to measure the heat content of the ocean. Um, Dr. Boyer mentioned some, uh, some uncertainties and, and sparseness of data. On the other hand, uh, in the first half of his talk, if he would have stopped there, I would have thought, okay, we know that a large amount of the heat is going into the ocean, the ocean's warming up. Uh, what exactly uh, don't we know and how problematic is that? Wait, first of all, pl please refer to me as, as Tim. Thanks. But, um, we, we do know, we know that long term, on, on decadal and longer time scales, that the ocean has been warming up since about 1955. It, it's tougher from the in situ data to, to look at interannual variability. That's where the uncertainty um, causes a problem. I mean, we would like to see, I mean, we, my, my group at, at NOAA, calculate uh, ocean heat content quarterly uh, for, for three, three months, over three months periods. But the uncertainty is so large that it, it is as large or larger than that signal that we're looking for at that small a time scale. So on, on time scales um, smaller than, than five or six years, you can't, you, can't, um, you, you can't discern the signal from the noise, basically. So we would like to get better. Hey, uh, Bob Henson at Weather Underground. Just to, to follow up on that with, uh, with Tim. So is, is it possible to look at time scales of, say, 15 or 20 years and look, for example, at the influence of you know, what's called the Pacific Dec Decadal Oscillation to see if the periods when you have more El Ninos are in fact releasing heat from the oceans as a whole, and conversely, the periods with more La Nina is taking up heat, or you know, if you expand it out to that time scale, is there a little more information in the record since the 50s or not? Uh, if, if I understand the question, you're saying can we can we discern areas of La Nina and El Nino? Uh, what I'm asking is whether, in fact, I mean, there's this general impression I've gotten that. Um, when you have periods like the pause, you know, the atmospheric pause or slowdown in global warming, that, that's a misnomer in part because oceans are taking up more heat during these periods when the, the global atmos atmospheric temperature is, is increasing less rapidly. Then there's periods, say the 80s and 90s, when the atmospheric temperature is increasing more rapidly and you're also having more El Ninos during that period. So there's this kind of loose idea that the oceans are giving up more heat in the, to the atmosphere during those periods and then taking up more of the heat relative to the atmosphere during these spells with more La Ninas. And I understand you can't parse it out year to year, but can you parse it out in like 15 year periods? Yeah, so if you're, you're, you're talking about like the global warming hiatus period from 1998 to 2013, and over that period, yes, we, 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 we can be pretty certain that over that long of a time period, um, we, we can discern whether heat's going into or out of the ocean. Um, what, what's a little harder is is kind of pinpointing that, and that the, the reason it's hard to pinpoint, like when I say pinpoint, is it due to the El Nino-La Nina cycle, or is there more? Is more heat going deeper down into the ocean? It's because the global warming hiatus is based on the, the, the change in global mean surface temperature. But as I showed, the atmospheric portion of the heat is very, very small. So the atmosphere, that little bit of heat in the atmosphere that would need to change to cause the global warming hiatus is basically smaller than the uncertainty of the ocean heat content calculation. So to really get a good hand on the, handle on the geographic distribution and where exactly that heat is, is increasing into the ocean, assu assumedly due to in the global warming hiatus period, we need, we need better measurements or a better method. It, is that uh, covered? Okay. Are there any other questions in the room? Nope. Horst Wademacher, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung in Germany. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit at a loss uh, with all your talks. On the one hand, uh, Dr. Boyer, who wants to be called Tim, um, says 
I can measure, or I'm attempting to measure using the magnetic field, the general heat uptake of the ocean. How much warmer does it get by using magnetic measurements? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and just to stop you quickly, uh, I, I'm not, I'm, when I say in situ data, I mean in, in situ temperature data. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on that. Not, uh, not magnetic field. I, I apologize for not yeah, being clear. Okay. Um, but then for, um, if I may use the first names, Catherine and Stephanie, uh, you were talking about essentially surface waters, right? I mean, the, the, the water that melts the uh, underneath the ice sheet that's in the first couple of hundred meters, that's not very much deep water that, that you are talking. So are we talking about mo more the heat change in the surface waters of the oceans or in the deep waters of the oceans? That's what I didn't understand. If I could just, I'll say something. Um, so what I was talking about, uh, the, the waters that melt the ice shelves of Antarctica and can access uh, Antarctica are down to about 500 meters, which is still technically sort of shallow. But those are f coming from circumpolar deep water, which is offshore uh, in the deep ocean. So the deepest waters of Antarctica are the warmest. And those are the things that are sort of shoaling and coming up onto the shallow, shallower shelves. So it's still the deep, the deep ocean that I was referencing. And I can clarify on the uh, on the magnetic part. That was me talking about the magnetic fields being used to monitor uh, heat content. In that in that case, it's the full depth integral of, of ocean heat that the that the external magnetic fields would be sensitive to. Uh, th that isn't measurements of the heat content. That's a uh, a method that we're working on for potentially measuring. And I could clarify that even though we use sea surface temperature as one of the proxies, um, the amount of nutrients that reach the surface is due to the circulation changes. And those are often starting at mid-latitudes. And you know, it's waters that sink to intermediate depths and then move at intermediate depths you know, around 500 meters over to the coast of New Guinea and then gradually rise toward the surface. Um, so even though we need to see what's happening at the surface, because that's where the sun um, allows photosynthesis and blooms, the water has originated at, you know, it's coming from depth to cause those. Go ahead, Harvey. Uh, Harvey Leifert, Freelance. Uh, I think it's for uh, Dr. Scaladuz. You spoke about the tuna during El Nino, La Nina events, and how they move along the, well, you go the terminator line between productive and non-productive waters. Is there any understanding of why that is? Why wouldn't they just be in the middle of where it's productive? Apparently, they're visual feeders. And so they stay on the um, unproductive side so that they can see. But then they dart over to the productive side to, to eat. Thank you. Rick Lovett, Freelance. Um, so I, uh, this is about the magnetic fields. Um, it strikes me that, that you could get a difference in stratification um, of of temperature also, um, it, it, you, it's, it seems like you have a really difficult inversion problem if, if you're... The, uh, there would, wouldn't likely be information about the three-dimensional uh, features, so we wouldn't know about the, we basically only get the integrals. To, to be able to sound uh, those other features, you'd have to use much higher frequencies. So I guess my question is, if you have multiple variables going on, um, you could have multiple solutions. Yeah, inversion problems are notoriously non-unique, um, but this is uh, not as difficult as they come. Are there any other questions in the room? Oh, there are. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is uh, based on the chlorophyll anomaly. I'm just curious how the absolute value of chlorophyll if you plotted that, how that would, if that would give you a different story, um, because in some places it might have a large anomaly, but it might have already a high amount to start with, and some places it might have a small anomaly, but have a very, very low amount. Um, and I'm just curious what the effect uh, is. There's a lot of focus on the Eastern Pacific, but during the El Ninos, is, does that greatly benefit the Western Pacific? Absolute values. Let me see if I can pull that one back up. That Havmuller plot. Um, oops. Sorry. Yeah. So this is this is absolute values. 
So does that, does that answer your question? There are, um, you know, much higher values off of the um, east coast of South America, and then, you know, so ranging, this area in general is, it's not as productive as, say, the North Atlantic or the North Pacific, but for this area, these are the, these are the values. Are there any other reporters in the room who have questions? Please state your name and affiliation. Rick Mishlevsky, The Register. I'm sorry if this is a somewhat naive question, but do, did I understand correctly that El Nino periods, which are generally warmer temperature periods, are less productive? So the follow-on to that is with the ocean, I realize it's up and down, and I realize it's overturning and circulating. Would it follow then that phytoplankton would be less productive in a warmer world? That's a big open question, and a lot of people are wondering that, and, and they're wondering if, they're, if we're gonna have more El Ninos. Um, at this point, the range of El Ninos that we've had is within the range of natural variability, but that's exactly what a lot of scientists are studying now. And I, um, I neglected to mention the reason you have less productive waters during El Nino is because along the equator, the um, thermocline which normally slopes from east to west and, and brings that cooler, nutrient-rich water, it flattens during an El Nino. So that's the reason for the, the strong correlation with temperature. Andy Ferguson, uh, Center for Climate Protection in Santa Rosa. Is there, can I interpret that uh, graph to indicate that there is less total productivity in a significant way after the year 2000? Well, so like the Weather Underground man asked the question, we do see decadal patterns. And so when there's a, um, a warm period and it typically has more El Ninos, you have, um, you have a, a less productive in general and, and vice versa. Um, so, you know, I didn't, I, I was trying to not calculate a, a complete trend with these, you know, and keep them more in the relative sense because um, because we don't have in-situ data to anchor them, but yes. There appears to be a signal from the bottom to the top of that chart. Right. And that's what I'm trying to understand better. Yeah, and, and one thing we definitely notice is there's a region in the, um, in the, in the sort of the East Pacific, but the Western side of it, where we see a, a, an area that's different and it's getting the equatorial undercurrent. It's, um, it's becoming shallower and faster. That's been covered in physical oceanography studies. Um, and that brings essential nutrients up, and that, and that seems to be causing the spatial pattern to shift. Um, so not as many of those essential, nu those essential nutrients are being received farther west and not reaching all the way east as much. Thank you. Brendan, are there any, other, any questions on the chat? No. Um, any other reporters in the room? Okay, great. That concludes our press conference. Thank you.